Welcome to the science segment here on IMPACT. I'm Barbara Brabetz. My guest today is Dr. Philip Ortiz, mentor and area coordinator at Empire State College in the field of natural sciences. Welcome to the show, Phil. Thank you, Barbara. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's talk a little bit about your educational background. Uh, you are SUNY born and bred. Absolutely. And so undergraduate? SUNY Binghamton. Binghamton. Uh, graduate school? SUNY Stony Brook. Stony Brook. Downstate and downstate, if we can think of Binghamton as downstate. And then you uh, took a, a jaunt off campus, so to speak, to the National Institutes of Health for a postdoc. And now you're up here in Saratoga and Queensbury at Empire State College, also a SUNY. That is correct. So SUNY Empire State College is different than all the other SUNYs, so to speak, the regular SUNYs. What makes it different? Well, um, first of all, geographically, let's talk about that. Uh, SUNY has 64 sites throughout the uh, New York State. Empire State is considered to be one of those 64, but ourselves, we have 35 different locations throughout mm. the state. We have regional locations that serve geographic areas, and we also have a, a graduate program, as well as the Center for Distance Learning, which uh, is the hub for the distance learning within Empire State College. So from what I understand, a student who goes to Empire State, they could go to a traditional class model the way uh, most students in SUNY do. They could go to a purely distance learning model, and that means that they could really be anywhere on the planet and take your courses as long as they have access to a good internet connection. And then there are hybrids as well. So could we talk about why Empire State has such a hold on distance learning and what gives it such great credence for that? Um. Empire State has been doing distance learning in various forms for uh, over 30 years. Uh, we started in traditional uh, mail-based correspondence courses. We moved away from that quite a long time ago. We uh, were leaders in the SUNY by satellite uh, initiative that has come and gone. And now we're very active as, as part of the SUNY Learning Network, which uses um, distance learning tools uh, in the form of web-based tools to deliver content and uh, help students learn. Now you have students who are native freshmen coming straight out of high school and you have octogenarians who are taking classes and getting degrees. So, but really the niche that Empire State is most known for is helping the adult learner. Could we talk uh, about why it's so special, why it's not University of Phoenix for example? What's the difference? Well let me first address why we're not University of Phoenix. I think it's very important to draw a distinction between the for-profit uh, distance learning schools from the not-for-profit uh, schools such as SUNY. Uh, the for-profit institutions have one motive, and that is to make a profit. The for-profit, uh, the not-for-profits like Empire State, our primary and sole goal is to help the student learn, to help the student achieve their goals. Our goal is not to make a profit, our goal is to help them achieve theirs. Um, and for that reason, all of our um, money that we collect in tuition is fed back to the student either in direct support through their instructors or through um, any number of uh, support mechanisms that we have in place for them. And there's quite a lot of data that suggests that University of Phoenix and other for-profit models really don't serve the student well. That's absolutely true, and it's quite unfortunate. Uh, I believe the most recent data demonstrates that the for-profit schools deliver about 12% of the higher education credits. On the other hand, they account for nearly 24% of the financial aid that's given to students, but nearly 50% of the financial aid defaults. Um, and so what happens is those students take loans, um, they can't complete their credits, they don't complete their degree, but instead they're saddled with massive debt, which very likely uh, will uh, forever dash their hopes of being able to achieve a higher education degree. And, of course, it's a burden not only upon them, but also upon the systems that provide financial aid to other students. It, yes, and I would actually take it a step further. Since most of our students are adults, um, it, it actually impairs their children's ability to move ahead in higher education. So it becomes sort of a, a legacy issue. Oh, yes, that's, that's a, a great point. Now, you work within the sciences. If we have a learner out there who's thinking, hey, I, I've got some credits, I've been working in the field for 20 odd years, I really want to pursue this field, how do they go about it if they uh, contact Empire State? Well, uh, through Empire State College, as you mentioned, we have a number of different learning modalities, whether it be face-to-face -face tutorials uh, with a faculty member or group studies, uh, which are similar to small classrooms, or the distance learning uh, tool. Um, in distance learning, where I uh, do most of my efforts, we uh, break students into groups of about 20 students, so it's a very small electronic classroom where they have a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact with the instructor. Uh, that contact is usually in the written form, 
So they interact with their instructor and their classmates through the uh, through the what we call course uh, management system. Um, but there's also the opportunity for uh, uh, the students to engage in group projects, uh, as well as complete laboratory type uh, type work as well. So they still get that team building exercise. They still have synchronous connections with other students. They still have that feeling of college without the late night hangovers and. Uh, sticky floors. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and what's nice about distance learning is the students can really do the learning on their schedule. So we might have stay-at-home parents who are uh, doing their coursework between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. while their kids are in school. We might have other people that have full-time jobs and they're working their studies around their family lives and um, and and their employment. So we, we try to make our courses as asynchronous as possible so that the student can do the work on their schedule, not on ours. So let's talk again about that adult learner or potential adult learner who's now thinking, I want to go back to school. I've got a lot of years of experience. How does Empire State look at that experience and then make an assessment? Well, when a student enrolls with us as a matriculating student, they have the option to engage in PLA. It's a prior learning assessment. And in that process, what we do is we look at what the student lear has learned in their lives independent of how they've learned it. So one of the great misnomers about adult education is that students get credit for experience. That's absolutely not true. Don't get credit for the experience, but you get credit for the learning that has occurred during that experience, and that's the important part. So give us, give us an example of how that plays out. Okay, sure. So let's say a student comes to us and say, well, I'd like uh, uh, credit for the laboratory work I've done in the hematology lab. And the student might say to us, I've been a technician in the hematology lab for 10 years in a hospital. And we say, that's great, that's very good experience. Let's now dig down and, and determine what it is that you've learned in that 10 years in the lab. And we'll, we'll start to look at the content. And um, if the mentor who's working with the student is uh, satisfied that there is a, some learning there, we'll then go out and get a third party uh, evaluator who's expert in that field to, uh, to work with the student and determine if that learning that has occurred is at the college level. And if it is, then we'll determine uh, the number of credits that are appropriate and the level of that learning. Is it advanced level? Is it introductory level, et cetera? So when we also think about the traditional college degree, we think about starting in August or September and kind of running to May, having a summer job up in Lake George, and then coming back and doing it all over again. That doesn't really fit the Empire State model, or Empire State, shall I say, is a little bit more flexible than the rest of us. Yes. How does that work? We're much more flexible because, again, we're about the student, not about collecting the tuition dollars. Uh, we, are, we have five starts every year. Uh, we have terms that start in September, November, January, March, and May. And we're thinking about adding a, a yet a sixth start that will be, start in the middle of the summer. Students can start at any one of those terms. And even the dates of those terms are set so that there is some built-in flexibility. So, for example, our September start begins roughly mid-September, and one of the reasons we like that start date is for those parents who are sending kids off to college or sending kids to start the school year, we start after that. So they can get through that very difficult, very busy time, then they can begin their own studies. And then we will uh, close that semester full 15 weeks later, but before the holidays. Well, let's talk about some of your other work outside of Empire State. Um, you are, par are part of a state task force on science, technology, engineering, and math, the so-called STEM disciplines. Could you talk about the state conference and, and how you've been involved and also in the diversity issues involved? Great. Um, excellent question. As you know, uh, Chancellor Zimfer, uh, SUNY Chancellor Zimfer, is very interested in STEM education, very interested in the STEM pipeline, uh, very interested in making sure that SUNY contributes effectively to the economic development of New York State. And Let me just interrupt. The pipeline, it's a little bit too much educational ease for those out there. We're not talking about some kind of tar sands here. <laughs> We're talking about the idea that education starts at birth and really there should be a seamless pipeline all the way to employment. Yes, the cradle to career pipeline as we like cradle to say. Cradle to career. Um, and in, that, in the case of STEM and SUNY, what we're very interested in is making sure students transition from high school to uh, the uh, colleges and universities effectively and then transition into careers effectively. Um, now, we do know that that pipeline, to use the metaphor, is relatively leaky and that we lose students at many steps. Um, the pipeline is particularly, particularly leaky for underserved students and students in both inner cities as well, well as rural school districts. And so SUNY um, 
uh, t twice now, every other year, and it's going to continue into the future, has a STEM conference where we bring together educators from throughout New York State to discuss the best practices um, at addressing um, STEM education. So trying to plug the pipeline, give best practices to make sure that we can engage the students who want to be engaged and keep them on their career paths. Absolutely. Uh, for more information, how can someone out there uh, contact Empire State College? Perhaps the easiest way is just to check our website, www.esc.edu. Terrific. Thanks so much for being here on the show. You've been watching the science segment here on Impact.